हेलो हेलो डॉक्टर सानोस गुड इवनिंग सर गुड इवनिंग सो इज द वीडियो क्लियर एंड व्हाट अबाउट द ऑडियो फ्रॉम आवर साइड या आई थिंक इट्स इट्स क्लियर सर एम आई ऑडिबल या या वेरी क्लियर वेरी क्लियर एंड आई होप दिस इज द इनिशियल यू नो हिकअप in any zoom interview this video <laughs> and uh, uh, audio and all that so thankfully we had uh, no very major issues uh, during last four five months okay. we are lucky uh, and had there been some bill then you know we do it uh, through editing and all that so the main contents are available uh, and uh, Uh, now i would like to ask you one thing more uh, would you like to use your ppt etc yeah i have a ppt so i would like to share that yeah yeah so uh, in that case uh, we will make you the host okay and okay. then you can share your screen your ppt whatever you like so okay. uh, we will make you the host uh, just in a few second and uh, so that's our uh, really you have chosen a subject which is of uh, uh, to be heard these days Uh, in all you know activities human activities i would say uh, it seems uh, uh, nothing is uh, possible without artificial intelligence yeah all, yeah you're, you're absolutely right sir yeah yeah so um, really it's a very noble uh, concept i would say and it had make i think things uh, a little easier convenient and safer i think also because uh, as a layman i am uh, telling all this i do not know anything about artificial intelligence and, so i uh, hope after this session you would get a fair idea of what ai is yeah yeah that's why you know uh, my attention focused on your profile and uh, then uh, i thought uh, nobody else could have been uh, better equipped than you who has been doing a lot of research on this subject that yes. uh, uh, we should invite you and uh, really we are thankful to you for uh, uh, sparing time thank you ma'am and uh, uh, i think the students will also benefit uh, because this is a new concept it is gaining ground and uh, particularly in the field of uh, national security it has become you know um, a much wanted uh, uh, matter uh, i think uh, Uh, our national security requires all this in, uh, intelligence and all that. This so, is the need uh, of. Do you, do you think that uh, man is being replaced by robo and all these things, artificial intelligence? I I very strongly feel that uh, wherever you know uh, the mundane tasks of our lives that that are very repetitive in nature, for that yeah. I think AI is a boon. Yeah, and it should be used and it should be leveraged in that way. But if you say that you know it, it is going to replace humans uh, in every possible manner, I don't think so. That okay. is the hype that is around it. So that that's the that's the uh, you know most pressing worry. <laughs> I know, I know, and uh, with these you know sci-fi movies that we watch on our uh, television, it it makes it all the more you know. Uh, of interest to the younger lot thinking that yeah. eventually it it might end up replacing humans but that will not be the case because human will always be in the picture and that is how i feel uh, the intellects see it and the experts as well and that that is also one of the reason that if you if you actually see nowadays there's been so many uh, so much of talk going around the governance of ai Yeah. that is uh, one of the reason and i will briefly point that out also in my presentation today that yeah, yeah. it is really uh, very important to have governance of artificial intelligence yeah, yeah. so that uh, there is always a human factor in the picture be beneficial to them also so now please go ahead with your uh, lecture thank you thank you so much for having me and you very uh, rightly mentioned uh, about uh, the importance of new emerging and disruptive technologies uh for foreign policy for national security as well so with this i will start my talk and my presentation i hope my screen is visible to all of you i will just go in the full screen mode so uh the outline of my presentation will be 
I will start off with uh, artificial intelligence. What is AI? Uh, what 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 is the uh, you know background of AI from where it began and how uh, it connects with the national security today. I will also touch upon uh, AI's penetration into the national uh, security vis-a-vis uh, -vis global uh, geopolitics. Uh, I will very briefly mention about what US and China are doing uh, in this field and uh, what are the threats and disruptions that, are, that currently exist uh, uh, with the use of this technology. And uh, then I would come on to the India's AI implementation roadmap, where India stands today, what are uh, what uh, new uh, initiatives we have started towards uh, adopting and deployment of this technology. And uh, finally, I will uh, discuss the challenges and opportunities revolving around it, and uh, I will conclude my presentation. So just to begin with, what is AI? And here uh, on my screen, you can see a lot of text and information. These, these are the numerous definitions that you will find in literature. And I'm not going to like, you know, uh, repeat these definitions, but the point that I wanted to make with this is that AI has no one specific definition. You know, it is it is a stream of study. And we when we call it as a technology, it is not a technology, but is an, it is an enabler to various technologies. It is a constellation to various technologies. And the basic idea of AI is that what we want to achieve from this, this uh, you know, technology that we say is that we want machines to mimic humans or uh, may maybe outperform human uh, cognition. That is what the basic idea of artificial intelligence is. And you can, you, in literature, you can find numerous definitions. And, you know, this is uh, one of the challenge also with this uh, technology because people perceive it according to themselves. Uh, because of new, numerous definitions, a lot of organizations, they use it in, a, in, in their own benefit. And that is one of the, um, you know, challenge or risk of this technology is as well. So... Uh, and uh, today you can see that, you know, artificial has so seamlessly, it has penetrated into our lives. Uh, uh, if you just pick up your smartphone phone, uh, from the voice assistants that we use, like Alexa, Siri, uh, to, uh, uh, to various uh, uh, image recognition softwares that we use, you pick any sector, may, uh, you know, healthcare, or, uh, or for that matter, agri agriculture, um, you pick any, any sector and you will find the use of this technology there. You will find uh, some role of artificial intelligence. Uh, drones is one uh, example, self-driving cars. So all, all these, you know, uh, uh, applications uh, or uh, rather various sectors, if I say uh, climate change is another sector where AI is being used, space is another one. So you name any sector and you will find its applicability. That is what the potential of artificial intelligence is. And just on this screen, if you see, I have given a, a very simplistic definition for all of you, for all the students uh, to understand that what AI is. So AI refers to the ability of machines to perform cognitive tasks like thinking, perceiving, learning, problem solving, and decision making. That is what AI is. And as I mentioned, it is a constellation of technologies uh, where, you know, which enables machines to act with a higher level of intelligence. And as I mentioned that, you know, the penetration of AI AI has happened into our systems and why it has exploded is because of these three points that you can see here on the slide. The first is that there is an unlimited access to computing power. With the changing times, with the kind of processing capabilities we have with advanced computers and computing machines, that has given, that has aided, you know, uh, this technology to explode. Uh, the second uh, factor is the cost of storing data and the availability of that data. So because today we are, uh, 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 you know, uh, okay. So if I say that, uh, could any one of you tell me that what uh, in every day, you know, a per day, how much data gets produced around the world? So if I say it is about 2.5 quintillion bytes of data that is being generated through our phones, through our laptops, through our machines, that is the amount of data that is being generated. So we have that uh, storage of data available with us through the through cloud platforms now. So we have the data, we have uh, structured data also with the, with the availability of automation that is happening in every businesses across various sectors. So because of these three factors, this, uh, this technology has penetrated and it has exploded in, in ways that we never imagined in our lives before. 
and uh, and uh, you know when we talk about uh, ai there are two major things that we see in 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 in, in any ai uh, enabled system and that is adaptivity and uh, autonomy so that is what you want to achieve with an ai system that you want that system to perform independently without any human intervention and second is adaptability that means it should be able to adapt in an unknown environment so you train the system that is what the process of ai is you feed the data into the system you train the system as per the algorithm or the model that you have devised and then you leave it in an unknown environment and you want it to function in that function in that environment and give you certain perspective predictions or help or aid the stakeholders in making decisions so that is what uh, the purpose or the method uh, of any ai system is so uh, in terms of characteristics is if i say i have it is it is just a repetition of what i have just mentioned that it is it has the potential to be integrated into various or a variety of applications it it has dual use because it is uh, it can be used in private sector as well as in military and i will come on to this and i will give you some uh, very interesting examples on it and uh, the third is that uh, because of the nature of this technology we call it that it has a black box uh, Uh, nature because everything is not transparent to the stakeholder how this machine has come to a certain decision is not transparent which uh, uh, due to which you know the integration of uh, ai into certain product may not be immediately recognizable but uh, you know now there is there are different concepts of ai which are also coming into play uh, one of them is explainable ai where the stakeholder will get a fair idea of how a system is performing so in terms of timeline if i say it started uh, somewhere in 1940 when the uh, research on artificial intelligence began and uh, it has moved uh, up to to the ladder and uh, here in this timeline you can see 2010 was the time where this this technology uh, the interest of uh, intellectuals and experts uh, gained it gained a lot of attention and again it was because of the availability of data that was there it was uh, improvement in the comp uh, computers processing power and the machine learning algorithms uh, that were being devised and from there on we have seen um, you know we have heard about uh, a lot of uh, computer systems or uh, algorithms like uh, deep blue which has uh, beated uh, uh, defeated the chess uh, champions and uh, uh, they, they, we have seen such automated systems or autonomous systems so that that is the uh, uh, example of narrow ai where you want a machine to perform a specific problem say for example chess playing or say image recognition where you uh, want a, a machine to just do once uh, uh, address one specific problem that comes under the branch of narrow ai and general ai is where we want to reach where we want that machine to perform a broad range of tasks we want it to have a human kind of an intelligence so we are currently somewhere in between two uh, where we are uh, very uh, using this technology or leveraging uh, this technology very well for the narrow set of problems and towards uh, general ai is what we aim to reach so this is again how this machine learning process uh, or artificial intelligence algorithm functions it learns from experiences the more data you feed in the, into the system the more training it will get and the better it will perform when you actually want it to come out with results or solve complex problems so coming on to uh, the national security uh, perspective how it is related to national security it has gained uh, you know the attention of commercial investors defense intellectuals uh, policy makers and international competitors now due to the um, you know effect of cyber or cyber attacks ai has played an increasing role in uh, the cyber world as well and towards the growth of hybrid warfare and that is the reason it has gained so much attention and and uh, it it has that potential to affect the national security as well so uh, uh, there is a uh, national security commission on ai which states um, ai to be world altering and i quote that it has the capability to predict ai technologies 
which will be a source of enormous power for companies and countries then that harness them unquote so this is the these are the kind of statements uh, that are being made from international organizations worldwide uh, it is also been stated uh, that it has the potential to be a transformative national security technology which will be on par with uh, nuclear weapons aircraft computers and biotech so that is uh, the potential of uh, this technology which is being stressed upon now uh, when we talk uh, uh, again uh, when i say that uh, how it is going to affect the national security uh, the ai and national security work stream it has basically two major goals or two core goals the first is to understand the impact of ai on international and domestic uh, environments so that is very important that how it is going to shape great power competition how it is going to affect the deterrence and stability uh, of any country and second is to develop guidelines Uh, to develop policy uh, framework for responsible use of ai and that is not only for militaries and uh, not only for you know lethal weapons but also for other applications uh, maybe like you know um, uh, logistics military logistics or command and control systems or information and surveillance systems so it needs to be governed well it, uh, it there should be a framework for having a responsible use of ai and that is uh, uh a uh, you know a very hot topic of debate these days if you if you read around this technology so it has affected national security it is driving changes in the areas of mil military dominance information dominance and economic dominance uh, there is all this you know very good chance that it could uh, lead to a new industrial revolution in terms of the automation that is uh, it has brought into the private sector now as i was mentioning it has uh, you know applications in defense as well it is being used in isr logistics cyberspace uh, information operations for command and control in semi autonomous uh, and autonomous vehicles like drones uavs ugvs and in lethal autonomous weapon systems which we also call as laws so this is a very interesting example of a, a project maven uh, this this is uh, this was a uh, started by google and the us department of defense they devised a machine learning model uh, and uh, this software uh, it was named as project maven it is a very famous software i'm sure the younger lot would have heard about this so this algorithm or this model was trained to identify 38 different kind of objects and the data was collected from the uh, 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 from the drones so uh, the surveillance footages were gathered and uh, this is how the model was created and it was able to identify uh, different kinds of objects and it is being deployed in uh, iraq and syria to identify the insurgents as well this is another screenshot of the same and uh, it has been uh, deployed in middle east africa uh, where various military analysts they are sifting through these mountains of data through the sensors uh, through drones and uh, they have been actually able to uh, you know devise it into actionable intelligence through this this is another example where uh, you know china is uh, using uh, training and simulation softwares because uh, we all know that china lacks the real world combat experience so they very uh, much rely on these war gaming softwares uh, this ai based war gaming software uh, they are using it and uh, this is a, a war game in taiwan strait so they 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 train their uh, militaries on such uh, war gaming softwares and it is inspired by the uh, deep minds starcraft playing ai system alpha star now this is another example of chinese uh, command and control they are using this software star c and uh, it was actually able to identify an uh, us naval asset in california so these are the kind of you know ai enabled systems that are being developed uh by countries like us and china and they are deploying it and they are gain, gaining uh, you know intelligence out of such softwares so uh coming on to the um, military potential or what this technology holds this was a survey which was which, which was done and uh, among the top 10 military technologies you can see ai was heading with about 20% of uh, votes uh another uh 
report uh, this was by ibm uh, and this was carried out among i think 350 institutions uh, sorry 350 um, uh, uh, defense uh, institutions how they are adopting artificial intelligence and out, out of these if you see about 49% of the defense organizations they have already uh, in the implementation phase of ai uh, either they are in the implementation phase or operating or optimizing phase so 49% of these defense organizations, they are in the deployment phase. And if I break that down further to see that which are the uh, defense areas where this is being deployed, uh, the first uh, four that you can see here are uh, the ISR, that is intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance, then the autonomous systems, cyberspace and information operations and deep fakes. So this is where uh, the most of the uh, adoption of AI is happening. Now connecting it to uh, seeing through the lens of global geopolitics, how other countries are doing. So countries like China, uh, they came out with a detailed plan that how they intend to lead in AI by 2030. So they came out with their uh, plan in 2017. And after that, uh, in the same year, we also heard Putin stating, and it was a very famous statement that he made that who, whosoever is going to become the leader in this technology or in the field of AI will eventually rule the world. And following US and there, there, are, there are more than 50 countries who have now come up with their uh, our national plan or uh, AI strategy uh, considering the uh, its utility or its penetration into the national security framework. Now this graph here, you can see that where India stands and where uh, US and China, they are leading in terms. So on one axis, it is the technology and uh, research. And on the other, it is the investments. So India is, uh, you know, trying to catch up with US, US and China, but the leading countries here, you can see are US, China, UK, France, Japan, and Germany, who are actually leading in uh, artificial intelligence research and in terms of investment as well. This is a brief uh, screenshot of uh, the US uh, adoption of AI. Uh, they began somewhere in 2018 where they understood the importance of this technology and the Department of Defense, they established a joint AI center. And further on, they have moved to the AI ethics principle, uh, how they have adopted these ethical principles. So they came out with numerous reports. And finally, in 2022, they, they have come out with another strategy on responsible use of AI. And there's another national AI advisory committee that has been formed uh, that is uh, advising the Biden government on how to proceed with the uh, uh, you know, national artificial intelligence efforts. So that is the kind of attention this technology has had. Coming on to China, uh, China came out with the establishment of PLASSF, which is People's Liberation Army Strategic Support Force, and uh, that they were intended to uh, work on emerging technologies and disruptive technologies and how they can get them into the military. So the Military Civil Fusion Development Commission was formed in 2017 and uh, the same year they came out with the next generation AI development plan. And their plan clearly states that by 2020, uh, China's AI industry will come in line with the competitors, which has already happened. We can see the, the national AI champions, companies like Baidu, Tencent, Alibaba. These companies are, you know, leading artificial intelligence in healthcare, in surveillance. So uh, they are right on track. Uh, in By 2025, they are going to be the world leaders in AI. And according to the next generation AI development plan, they, it has been stated that by 2030, they, uh, they wish to become the primary center for AI innovation. And the, the AI industry is going to reach 1 trillion RMB. And they are on track on, uh, if, if we see that they're on track on, on as per their timelines. These are the kinds of investments that are being made in AI. Uh, in 2021, uh, if I only talk about private sector, there was about $93.5 billion investment that was made in AI. And here you can see how China and US are investing despite the you know, tensions or conflicts uh, that they have. Uh, there, there have been cross-border deals happening uh, uh, between uh, US and China. Although they have now declined, but there's still a good number of uh, deals that are happening. 
Now, uh, if I try to relate it to what are the you know threats that revolve around this technology or use of this technology, because uh, artificial intelligence has a dual use, means that it can be it is it can be used by both defense and the private sector. So, so the flow of this technology, you know, is very easy or very difficult to uh, control. Why so? Because uh, initially what used to happen was whatever new technology uh, used to come, it, it used to, if it is of uh, importance or if it is of uh, 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 use for national security, it was uh, very well protected. But because this technology is now moving from private sector to, to the defense, the flow of this technology to control that flow is, is very hard. Say, for example, we, we can see uh, the use of drones for packet deliveries and uh, uh, we have this technology at our home and non-state actors or weak states can very well use this technology and they have the power or potential to weaponize it as well. So because of this, uh, uh, it can very well start a new arms race among the countries and uh, it, it also creates a trust deficit because the AI based tools uh, uh, they have started in asymmetric warfare. Uh, we can use such tools uh, uh, on various social media platforms, like to spread uh, uh, misinformation, disinformation, or creation of deep fakes. So this is a, another level of warfare which has started with the use of this technology. And Russia and Ukraine uh, conflict, we can see that has become a test bed for AI, uh, from use of drones like TV2, and uh, from various uh, you know softwares. Uh, AI-based software that was used, for example, Clearview AI was one, Spacehow was one, uh, one. then uh, there were some other softwares uh, where they were using uh, image recognition softwares. Uh, so the Clearview AI is a image recognition software that was used by Ukraine. It is a US-based software. So they were given the access of that software and that software crawled about 2.5 billion images from various Russian social media platforms. So they gathered those images and they could identify the Russian soldiers through that platform. Uh, similarly, there was another software. Uh, I think it's space now. It is a geospatial software. So it could actually, it is again a US based uh, software and uh, the access was given to the federals uh, for their use and they could detect the military players presence way before the conflict uh, you know, started. So that software could detect the military presence somewhere in Russian town. And uh, that is how US was able to know. And US has very clearly also stated that they are going to uh, keep using such softwares to gather as much information as they can. So these are certain threats that revolve with the use of this technology. Now coming on to India, uh, India started its AI journey in 2018 and they have established a center for AI uh, in, and robotics. This is a part of DRDO. This, uh, this, this works on various uh, technologies. Currently they are working on AI and robotics. And in 2018, uh, India came out with the national AI strategy. This was, this was uh, formed by the Niti Aayog. And in 2019, uh, two other uh, agencies were formed uh, that were designed to specifically focus on the uh, defense aspect of this technology. One is the DAIC, Defense AI Council, and the second is Defense AI Project Agency. And they have been given a funding of about 1,000 uh, crores per year to uh, invest and to make applications uh, for the defense. In 2020, uh, there was this new and emerging strategic technology division, which was came, which was introduced, and uh, its aim was to uh, check upon the, you know, uh, global uh, framework of use of this technology to form uh, bilateral and trilateral cooperation across globe uh, 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 with uh, use of AI or with use of new and emerging technologies. So NEST division works on that. In 2021, uh, uh, again, India came out with the responsible use of AI and it, was, it came out in two parts. Uh, the AI strategy that India has come out with, it is majorly focusing the private sector. So somewhere this was lacking in terms of uh, the defense sector. So uh, India needs to, you know, right now they need to come out uh, with a clear strategy of AI for defense as well. That is what I feel. Uh, in 2022, although there have been uh, 
numerous things that uh, they have come out with. Uh, very recently, there was a defense symposium uh, in July where 75 AI-enabled products were launched that was specifically for the defense sector. So in terms of uh, advancements, what all India has done, uh, this is again one of the very recent applications in August, uh, 140 uh, AI enabled systems were deployed across uh, borders, uh, the, which include high resolution cameras, sensor, UAV feeds, radar feeds, they are all integrated through AI so that they can detect the presence of any kind of intrusion at the borders. Uh, similarly, if I talk in terms of unmanned ground vehicles, the Chennai-based company, uh, there are a lot of startups which are coming in uh, uh, for uh, were working on the technology of unmanned systems like drones, UGVs, USVs. Uh, DRDO is very, uh, you know, uh, diligently working on development of autonomous systems. And then uh, there's another uh, driverless vehicle test track is coming up. It is uh, on the uh, campus of Indian Institute of Sciences, about 15 acres of this campus, uh, 15 acres of uh, campus will be used to build up this test track, uh, which will be again one of its kind. Uh, some other applications there are all, uh, Indian Navy is currently working on 30 AI projects. They have established an AI center of excellence in uh, uh, Jamnagar. Um, our Indian Army has also set up a military college for telecommunications and engineering in Mao. They, have, they will be working on artificial intelligence products for the defense. And uh, then again, we have, uh, uh, it, was, it was reported that in August this year, uh, Army will uh, conduct trials for all AI-enabled unmanned terrain vehicles. Um, I haven't come across reports that whether this has been done or not, but this is what it was uh, stated. So this is about the AI symposium that I just mentioned. There were 75 new products were launched and they were based on uh, autonomous systems, uh, robotic systems, blockchain technology, command and control, intelligence surveillance, uh, and lethal autonomous weapon systems as well. These are another some of the uh, three interesting uh, you know, projects from, from that list that I, that I picked up. First is the AI-enabled uh, voice transcription analysis software. Then there is fatigue monitoring system. And then evaluation of uh, welding defects in X-rays of non-destructive testing. So these are all AI-based. And the defense minister has also stated that uh, drawing lessons from the ongoing Russia-Ukraine war, the Indian Armed Forces are really pushing hard for adoption of these new technologies. So uh, as I mentioned that the governance of this technology is very important because there are issues related to policy, regulatory, and ethical use of uh, this uh, technology. Uh, there, you know, with artificial intelligence algorithms, there is always a chance of uh, having a biased or unfair data in terms of the ethnicity of the data, or uh, if you poison the data, we call it data poisoning is another term. So I will not stress into the you know, technicalities of this, but uh, why the regulation is important is because it has certain vulnerabilities which can be uh, you know, accessed by the uh, anomalous users. So that is very important to understand the vulnerabilities of the system and address it. Uh, uh, it has issues related to transparency and data access and then legal liability, of course, that who is going to be uh, questioned in case anything goes wrong with the autonomous uh, system, uh, uh, who will be held responsible. So there are certain issues uh, around it which requires attention. And that is why a clear framework, a clear in, uh, you know, vision on use of this technology is required. So the key takeaways is that we need a creation of supportive ecosystem. We, we need uh, infrastructure. We need policy regulations. Uh, human uh, human uh, resource development training of uh, this technology is very important. Uh, indigenous development is for sure the key if you want to really, uh, you know, match up with the uh, other countries. But so will be the bilateral or the uh, you know international cooperation with other countries uh, just to. Uh, have that technology flow 
in our country as well. Civil military fusion is another area which is very important. We need to tap the civil innovation ecosystem of AI because in India, uh, we are almost, uh, a, we are like a garage of about 30% of data, which is uh, going, uh, you know, out of, into the world. So, uh, and how AI systems are uh, playing a role here in India is also uh, very important. So we must tap that. We need that civil uh, innovation ecosystem and uh, we need to have collaboration with defense, with academia, with research, if we really want to succeed. So with this, I will, I will close my presentation and I will be open to questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sharma. Uh, for a very comprehensive, very exhaustive, and mind-blowing uh, presentation on the subject. And uh, I hope uh, the participants must have enjoyed it. And uh, before I uh, open the house for question answer session, uh, let us see how much uh, students are uh, uh, curious to know more about uh, this subject. So now I will ask the participants to uh, come with their questions. First, introduce yourself and then put the question in a simple and clear manner. Come on, be quick. Good evening, ma'am. Ma oh. You can go ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, good evening, ma'am. My name is Shorbani. I'm a postgraduate in political science from St. Xavier's College, Kolkata. And my question is regard to data protection and privacy with regard to the AL. So ma'am, as we know that the government is investing a lot of money in AL technology and we are seeing digital payments and uh, cloud technologies, cloud computing coming up together for data protection. But ma'am, my question is with regard to the, how much this data protection could be provided by these AL technologies, which are being brought from abroad, from abroad and then being developed in India. Uh, isn't there an issue that uh, when they are developing jointly any AL technology, there is uh, there are chances of the technology being leaked? See, I think this is a great question that you've asked. I really wanted to pick this in my presentation, but due to time, I haven't. See, with data protection, what happens is if you really want to implement a technology like artificial intelligence, where you're using a lot of algorithms, you need data. If you don't have the correct data, if you don't have the right uh, quality and quantity of data, you will never be able to come out with the, uh, you know, efficient or accurate solutions. All right. Having said that, I, uh, I completely agree that, you know, we need a data protection law wherein uh, the data that is being generated within our country uh, stays safe. But at the same time, uh, see, uh, if you see that graph that I shared with you, how US is growing uh, and succeeding in deployment of this technology is because they have uh, open data available with them. And uh, if you uh, conversely, if you compare it with the European countries, they have a stricter data protection laws. And still, you know, I was reading somewhere uh, uh, in Europe about 40% of, uh, you know, companies they claim to use, uh, they claim to sell products uh, saying that they, they are AI enabled and in fact they aren't. So, so, you know, that balance needs to be maintained and that is the reason uh, the new data protection law when it comes, uh, you know, will be very important to see that how gov government has actually devised uh, it. But I feel that both ways it is important. We need um, open data as well and we need to have a, have a certain um, protection on the data uh, so that uh, the uh, sensitive information is not leaked outside. Yes, next question. Hello, ma'am. I'm Gayatri Dandekar. I have completed my graduation from Ferguson College in History, Politics and Sociology. I had two questions regarding to this topic. One was actually very similar to Shorbani's. Uh, and second one is actually uh, something I feel it, it might be a little childish to ask, but I still want to ask you that, that we see that in movies such as Matrix or something, we see AI taking over the world. And at times, you know, there are uh, people who are very skeptical about this AI. Uh, so do you think that uh, while we are using AI to fight among ourselves, uh, AI can overpower the world? I want to know your opinion on that. See, I... Uh... 
first of all i would say that you know whatever uh, is shown in movies to a certain extent you can still relate to it but thinking that uh, eventually i will you know overtake the entire world i personally don't think is going to happen uh, for another 50 years i i can say that uh, but i will give you an, a very interesting example i don't know whether you've heard about it facebook uh, and i i can't uh, Uh, go back to which year they came out with but they came out with this ai based robots and they they designed two robots and uh, they were talking to each other so initially those oh, two yeah. robots, they were talking to each other and uh, they were perfectly fine but after a point there was some conflict between them and they start blabbering with each other in some machine language and eventually they shut down that project because that came out in public so so see always that human factor is yeah. going to be there whatever algorithms or robots or systems that we are designing a uh, human will somewhere have that control so that human uh, angle will always be there that that is what i feel and that is the reason the governance of uh, this technology is very important that is why regulation of this technology is very important how these systems are being used for that there, there needs there need to be a you know well structured framework about its governance its ethical use the trustworthiness of this technology and that is the reason one point i mentioned that there is a trust deficit you know re- related to this technology and that is the reason the stakeholders they don't have trust on this technology so that is uh, that needs to be worked upon okay thank you so much yeah. okay, next question good evening ma'am i am riya sharma and i am currently pursuing my masters in political science ma'am following the chinese territorial aggression in galwan in 2020 India had banned around 200 Chinese apps besides making uh, government approval uh, necessary for all the FDI coming from China. Ma'am I wanted to know the intensity or the effectiveness of these measures given the fact that Chinese investors already are one of the largest uh, uh, one of the largest actors in India's technology landscape. so ma'am what's the way out i mean neither can we remain de- totally dependent on china na- nor can we completely avoid engagement with it in the technology landscape yeah i think you've answered your question <laughs> yourself that we cannot completely you know at this point where we are because india is still uh, trying to get a strong foothold in terms of uh, these use of these technology and deployment of these technologies but uh, uh, ha- having said that we cannot like completely disengage with china because the kind of uh, uh, the level at, at which they are in terms of use of this technology development and deployment and uh, and uh, you know a very important uh, uh, point here is that they follow a very different framework in terms of technology development and deployment than uh, in than that we do here in india or say for example in us you know they have a very controlled uh, framework they have they are they are making technology which is specifically designed for you know surveillance purposes or for military use so they have that uh, control over uh, the their uh, security landscape uh, they they very strongly rely on military civil fusion and they are doing this since 1950 not just now this hasn't happened right now you know the military civil fusion of china this is happening since nine somewhere it started in 1940s if i'm not wrong so uh, where china is today it is because of the uh, kind of investments they have made and uh, from the time where they started so ha- they had at that point of time they had that kind of a vision with themselves india has just you know started maybe a decade back in terms of uh, establishing this kind of a framework where where the government is engaging with uh, the you know uh, private sector or with the uh, uh, organizations in terms of uh, de- getting this technology for the defense purposes as well so this will take time and you will have to see maybe wait for another decade or so to see how how things shape up for india Yes, come on. Next question. Come on, be quick. Yes, go on. My name is Nikhil. Uh, I am a ex UPSC aspirant and currently a working professional in an ethics firm. So my question uh, uh, was that 
currently uh, there are there is no concrete global treaty on on use of ai so how do you uh, look ahead in next next 20 30 years when uh, the capabilities of both china and usa would be far better than other smaller nations so how do you see uh, when we have a treaty for uh, let's say nuclear weapons and anything so how do you see a treaty a global treaty coming up for adoption of ai See, there has been talks on the uh, use of lethal and autonomous weapons uh, in in the conventions of Geneva, and there there have been talk on uh, CCW as well. But we have to really see uh, that how it shapes up. Uh, and uh, currently, if I see uh, in the international domain, there ha- there is a lot of talk about uh, you know uh, governance of this uh, technology or uh, establishment of a common regulatory framework and if i say that in terms of india how india is looking at it so india is having a lot of bilateral and uh, multilateral cooperation india is having um, uh, recently india has had a, a, a Uh, bilateral with japan on uh, india japan 2 plus 2 where they have discussed about uh, the uh, use of this technology or uh, use of emerging technologies like uh, ai iot cyber uh, then uh, there there have been numerous other uh, you know bilaterals india has had a uh, bilateral cooperation with finland also in quad also uh, this was discussed so there are a lot of talks going around uh, on how to use this technology or how to regulate this technology as well and even in the private sector if you see uh, in various summits you will see that this point always come up whenever you talk about artificial intelligence this the, the first point that comes up is the trustworthiness of this technology and the governance of this technology so uh, so yeah i agree with you currently there is no no such treaty but we might uh, see something uh, concrete coming up in the future because if we really want to leverage this uh, technology in a in a positive manner we will have to come up come up with uh, something uh, concrete yes any more questions Come on. I think uh, Dr. Sharma, you have already explained, you know, the subject in such an exhaustive manner that uh, uh, I don't think uh, uh, many more queries could be there. Things have been explained very well, and uh, I think the students have uh, tried to understand all that. Um, i would also like to draw your attention uh, i mean a little query is there i would like to seek your opinion about it uh, so far as uh, india's uh, uh, status or position on the use of ai uh, do you feel it is uh, satisfactory do you think something more should be done by the government oh currently the kind of initiatives that are coming up uh, is like idx and all where in, uh, where a government is also giving a lot of funding uh, uh, to the people but what i feel is that uh, see when we compare our defense budget with the defense budgets of uh, you know us or china we cannot match that at this point in time so what i feel is that government has to really you know the stakeholders really need to think through it that how much investment they want to make in this technology uh, be it uh, you know drones or uh, autonomous weapons or lethal autonomous weapons how much investment we are uh, ready to make at this point of time we need to have a very clear vision on uh, defense per se on uh, use of this technology which i feel somewhere is lacking so we need to i think the government should be very clear on this that what what their defense spending should be on this and what uh, what they want to achieve out of this and that will only come when they have a clear understanding of this technology how it functions and first uh, the first step will be you know having uh, a trust on this technology so so you know it is like a vicious kind of a circle so but yeah i think that needs to be figured out we need uh, to- the problem is uh, that uh, our defense budget uh, uh, takes a large chunk of uh, general budget we have to spend uh, 
a lot of funds on our defense requirements. And uh, I think uh, uh, that is a, a worrying factor for us. Yeah. And uh, uh, for other, you know, um, uh, areas of development, uh, uh, not much is left. And uh, this is uh, something which the government will have to think about to raise resources. Uh, of course, uh, unless we are uh, able to defend ourselves, our liberty or independence, uh, uh, we can't do justice uh, to all what we are trying to achieve. So uh, I think a lot of uh, efforts have to be done, a lot of initiatives have to be undertaken, and a lot of research is also uh, to be undertaken. Unless you research the subject, you uh, cannot come up with a uh, future exactly. plan and all that. Exactly. And that is you, why, you know, only indigenous development is not going to help. We would need, uh, you know, international cooperation in that. We have to learn from what, you know, US and China are doing, and then we have to come up with our own strategy. It, is not, it should not be like, you know, US is doing this, this, so we also have to do this. We first have to see our security framework. We have to first, under, you know, have a look at our security landscape and then think and decide that what really we want to do. Uh, when when it comes to deployment of this uh, technology, uh, is there any uh, you know forum or platform for uh, cooperation between different uh, nations of the world, whether major or a smaller uh, country, uh, on the cooperation of the use of this uh, AI? I think a lot of summits happen. Abhi currently also there is a AI global summit which is happening in I think Riyadh. Uh, where uh, a lot of, uh, you know, people from uh, UN, UNESCO, uh, 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 you know, uh, pe uh, people from uh, uh, the private sector, like uh, from Google, Microsoft, IBM, they are coming on onto one platform and they are discussing issues and, you know, what is the future of this technology. So there, there are a lot of, uh, you know, uh, such summits keep on happening. And that is why I was, uh, before this talk, I was mentioning to you that that is... Uh, you know, these days the, we are talking more about the governance of uh, this technology. Uh, yes, you are right. I mean, uh, you are working on this project, and we hope your inputs are taken note of uh, by the organizations, by the government, and uh, put into practice. Uh, because unless there is a, a proper research and uh, proper results are uh, uh, considered. Uh, nothing more can be done. So uh, with that, uh, we will like to come to this uh, end of this uh, 